my name's John Savarthi. I'm uh, Associate Professor of Medieval History at University College London. I'm also one of the, uh, the co-conveners of UCL Anthropocene, which is a sort of uh, a new initiative across a variety of different uh, social and historical sciences um, engaging with issues raised by the Anthropocene. Um, but this seminar is um, one that I'm co uh, with uh, a number of uh, wonderful colleagues, uh, including Anna Exerholter from Vienna, who will um, be speaking, uh, be responding to Pratik uh, later, um, uh, Amanda Power from the University of Oxford, uh, Sophie Page from UCL as well, uh, and Sujit Sivasundaram from, uh, from Cambridge. Um, this is a new um, seminar which has been uh, set up by the Institute of Historical Research in London, and we're very grateful uh, to them for that. Um, it's a new partnership seminar which is designed to sort of make, make the most of the very unpleasant situation we all are finding ourselves in um, right now by trying to you know, trying to create a bigger space that connects people interested in, in the particular topics of the seminars. So this is the first one of these new seminars to launch. So we're very, um, we're very pleased about uh, that. The seminars will be monthly and they will have a, a, a more discursive format than sort of traditional uh, seminars. Um, we're delighted to be doing that uh, today with Pratik Chakrabarti, uh, Chair of the History of Science and Medicine, uh, and director uh, at the Centre for the History of Science, Medicine and Technology at the University of Manchester, um, and whose uh, wonderful book, um, Inscriptions of Nature, which I um, warmly recommend to everyone, uh, is, uh, will, will form the sort of the basis of um, our conversation today. Inscriptions of Nature, uh, Geology and the Naturalisation um, of Antiquity. Um, so I'll pass over to Pratik in, in just a second. Um, just to let you know how this session um, will work. So uh, Pratik will speak um, for uh, you know, half an hour or so, not, not certainly not, not more than that. Um, then um, Anna and I uh, will um, sort of give some short responses um, uh, and then Pratik can, will have a, a chance to uh, respond to those. And then we'll, we'll open the question uh, open the floor out more more broadly to uh, to colleagues. Um, uh, but uh, let me then just uh, pass over to Pratik and uh, um, who's going to uh, talk about um, Anthropocene uh, and the challenges of deep historical thinking. Pratik, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for um, organizing uh, this workshop uh, and this series of uh, talks and inviting me for this particular talk, um, I'm delighted to be here. And I think it's an, uh, like so many of those um, IHR series this year, it's a vital one. Um, and, it's, um, and it's vital for uh, two reasons for me. Um, and I'm here to share those uh, reasons with you. Um, why One reason it is vital is for the ecological moment we find ourselves in. Um, we have experienced and seen and suffering from one of the most devastating ecological de um, destructions of the earth. And we are trying to understand the historical um, factors behind it. So Anthropocene provides us with some of the clues of understanding why we are in that this ecological moment. And, and for that reason, what the, the gravity and the, and the significance of the moment, there's so much literature, so much writing on um, Anthropocene and history and ecology and um, and um, the and, and time and and um, nature um, and what I wanted to talk about is not I, I'm not seeking to provide you an overview of this entire literature which is impossible to do but what I'm trying to um, identify is 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 a certain um, a certain problem in a way is because Anthropocene um, has a particular vision of the past. It is based on a vision of the past, of how things changed, how changes were made to nature, how nature changed, and how human agency changed nature. So there's a particular vision of the past. And what I'm trying to understand in my work and in this talk, uh, and I'm trying to share those uh, moments of, of, of problems that I'm facing, 
is that how historical imagination of the past aligns with the Anthropocene's own imagination of the past. That is the problem that I'm, I'm here to share with. Um, and that is, so the second reason why this conversation around Anthropocene histories is important is to understand how do historians engage with Anthropocene's own vision of the past. I'll just stop here and share my PowerPoint. It's not a very long PowerPoint. Hopefully it's not a very long talk. And um, I'll, I'll try to be as uh, quick and as, because I understand, um, you know, listening to a talk online with a PowerPoint is not the most exciting thing you can do in an afternoon. So I'll try to be as um, entertaining as I can be. So um, I just wanted to talk a bit about the image on, on the first screen. It is a landscape painting by an Australian um, Aboriginal painter, Cynthia Burke. And uh, one of the themes I will come back to uh, at the end of the talk is the, is the question of Aboriginality, uh, alternative visions of time, alternative visions of ecological changes that is also important in aligning with Anthropocene's uh, vision of the past. So how do we align these various multiple visions of landscape ecology with our vision of the Anthropocene? So um, as you know, um, uh, so a few weeks back, um, I was reading this very interesting news um, or, or this research about, uh, this is before Christmas. Uh, this is about the research conducted uh, by uh, scientists in Sima de las Hirsas in Spain about um, hibernation and, and how the early humans um, apparently survived the winters uh, by hibernating. And I was reading this um, with interest uh, because I'm sure you will appreciate that this is a winter we can all hope to hibernate. And so, uh, so it, was, uh, it was fascinating to know that early humans like animals um, and other animals um, hibernated through the winter. But what was interesting is um, there was this idea that various animals um, and um, um, hibernated like bears, bats, hedgehogs, uh, Neanderthals, the early prehistoric humans. And, um, and the comparison was with the contemporary indigenous uh, populations of Scandinavia, the Sami populations. And it's an assumption that um, if uh, bears, bats, and the Neanderthals hibernated, would the, the Sami hibernate similarly? No other individual, no other human groups were consulted, but the indigenous populations of the, of, um, the Scandinavian were believed to be of a similar um, physical and historical uh, designation that they should be following the same mode as well. I am sharing this with you because for me, this is the moment of the problem that I'm facing about, Aborig about Anthropocene's idea of the past. And this in a way is the problem. This is the problem of, um, of the Anthropocene. Um, it, it naturalizes the past and it, and it challenges us to understand the past in other ways. It, 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 is, it naturalizes the Sami as a part of the other uh, other humanities, and it 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 allows me to understand where this problem of naturalism comes come from. And 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 the problem that we have is that that is there uh, is there a uh, is there a, a problem in this imagination of Anthropocene as as something that helps us to understand our own uh, racial and evolutionary uh, ancestry, or is it does it actually create a divergence between our understanding of ourselves and understanding of other different human human species and and and, and the the sami as separate as from other human beings so what is the anthropocene i'm i'm not going to go into the great details of it as you know the the idea of the anthropocene is a favor, is a relatively new one and um, scientists uh, Paul uh, Crudson and Eugene Stormer suggested the name Anthropocene to be used um, for the epoch when human activity is considered to be the domain or the dominant influence on the environment, climate, and ecology of the earth. So the main changes that we are no longer just uh, that 
we are not no longer just changing the ecology, which we have done. We are, we are no longer making environmental changes, but we are actually, human beings, that is, are actually becoming a geological force. We are bringing about geological changes in the earth in terms of earthquakes, landslides, and we are changing. We are change, making deep changes in the earth, which are geological in nature. It's no longer just environmental changes. It is deep ecological, geological changes that human beings are bringing about in this earth, in this way. Now, I need to make a point that is very important. And I would like you to remember that point throughout this lecture and the discussion. Now, there is no question in my mind that we are living in a period of the Anthropocene, that human beings are making fundamental ecological changes in the earth and fundamental geological changes on the earth, that human beings have become a geological forces in the earth. What, what I am questioning is, is, is that the only vision of the past that is there? Or can historians, can historians understand this, this trajectory of the past that is there? So in a different way, or should historians adopt this anthropocenic vision of the past and write histories of the Anthropocene as it is given to us? So to, should this moment of the present define our understanding of the past itself? So to, so to do that, to understand this vision of the Anthropocene, what I'm going to do in a few, few uh, slides is understand the genesis of the idea of the Anthropocene, the genesis of the idea of this geohistorical time that is so fundamental in our understanding of the, of the Anthropocene. And I believe, and I, and I feel that we often use this geohistorical frame without critically understanding the evolution of this geohistorical frame. So um, this will be a slightly uh, text heavy slide um, and I'm, I'm, I apologize for this, but I'm trying to uh, encapsulate almost 200 years of um, intellectual tradition within a slide and I will fail miserably, but that's what it is trying to do. So please bear with me. And it will be a bit abstract and I will refer to uh, a lot of points in abstract, but I will come back with concrete examples as we move on. So please bear with me, but it's, it's so what is this, the frame? What is the geohistorical frame? Where did it come from? That on which Anthropocene and the idea of the Anthropocene is based on. So the fundamental uh, moment that this geohistorical um, vision starts is the European discovery of geohistory. The discovery of fossils, human remains, flame tools from the same 18th century place, the study of the earth and of the humans beyond the time scale of textual and religious traditions. Um, and the next uh, important moment is in the 1830s when the French polymath Paul Turner proposed the term historical to be used only for the period of recorded human history to distinguish it from the geological or the anti-historic, which became translated as prehistory, which is beyond decipherable, decipherable historical records. So the prehistory or the geological is a kind of time frame which is, which is beyond historical, which is beyond also the historical uh, methods that were used uh, in um, inscriptions to uh, texts, myths. It is a history that is located only in nature. It is only in the layers of the nature, in, only in the, in the fossils, only in the, in the strata that that history can be located. And that is where the idea of the geological time as a separate entity from the historical time is born. Now this moment is important. I'll spend a bit of time on this moment. Uh, this moment is important because this is the moment of the genesis of the idea of the earth without humans. That idea that dominates many of the anthropocenic and other geohistorical uh, literature, that there is a moment of the earth without humans. And that is the, the, the beginning of that vision becoming important. And that is why it is such a powerful moment that there is an earth, there is a moment of the earth without humans. And the this distinction is premised on a particular notion of the natural or naturalism in which nature becomes the only thing to understand this new form of the past and time. So within this geohistorical time, when there is no recorded history, 
the only way that can be studied is a study of nature. And that is a deep sense of naturalism because nature becomes the only way that one can study that nature. And it is through the naturalization of the present because what the geologist sees is not the past in itself. What the geologist observes or the anthropologist or the paleo archeologist observed was the moment in the present as we see the moment in our present. And in that moment of present, it is possible to put a natural frame that these are objects of nature and that natural frame then provides us with the geological vision. So human beings are un understanding nature in a form that is present, but in a form that allows the geohistorical moment to go back much farther into the past. This distinction between the historical and the geological or the natural, or how the historical affects the geological has been the fundamental theme in geohistory. It is that fundamental moment that there is a geological, which is a geological without humans, and there is the historical, which is the geological which with humans, and it is how that historical affects the geological in our present. The encroachment, the constant human encroachment on the geological is what shapes geohistory. And it has been fundamental in disciplines such as environmental history of how the natural is affected by the historical and indeed in the Anthropocene. Now, there is another trajectory in this um, where it is shown that how the geological informs the historical, which is, you know, the classic example will be Brothel's mountains come first, that it is actually the geological which uh, is the fundamental within which the historical is shaped. So it is, so Brothel's frame and others, and that's what Dipesh and others, others have suggested, is an inverse of the Anthropocene, that it is the historic, the geological in, uh, affecting the historical. Now, one of the main uh, problems that, that is there is um, that the, the environmental humanities as a discipline has introduced uh, the idea of the cultural within the natural, that how the nature has cultural perspectives, how nature has been appreciated within various different cultures in a, nat in a cultural frame. So what, and what environment, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, um, reduce a lot of discussion on, on a short basis. So um, environmental humanities have shown a cultural appreciation of nature. What has remained outside that frame and which is the problem that uh, I am engaging with here is that does not necessarily question the natural frame of the history itself. That, that there is a historic, there is a, there is a na nature which has its own history. It, it tries to cultural, provide a cultural scope to that natural history, but does not necessarily question or dismantle the, nat the, the natural frame of history, which is fundamental within the geological frame of understanding of the past. So uh, where is the problem? Where is the problem with what I am suggesting about the relationship between Anthropocene or Anthropocene's own vision of the past and historical history's own vision of the past? So the first is, uh, what do historians do here? What do we do? How do we write this history? It seems that the grand, grand conclusion has already been written. We have formed the conclusion that we are living in a moment where human beings are fundamentally changing the earth. So do we go back and write that same history and come to the same conclusion, which in a way is in a Kuhnian frame, Thomas Kuhnian frame, uh, a, history, a normal science activity where we are supposed to reach the same conclusion through different routes. So that's a challenge. Do we constantly come back to the same conclusion that yes, there is an anthropocentric moment in the present through different historical routes? Are we supposed to similarly naturalize our presence? Do we go? Do we watch our present moment as a, as a moment of the past and write the histories of the present as a natural moment about how these moments have been historically changed, which are actually na natural moments in itself? So these are natural moments in their purity, 
which, which has been historically distorted. So do we actually historicize, naturalize our presence in that respect? The concept of Anthropocene fixes people, nature and narratives to domains and historicities that appear natural to them. More importantly, it ties us to the binary narratives of the natural and the historical. So there can be two possibilities only. There can be a natural and there can be a historical. The Sami is natural and we are historical. I'm just simplifying it for the sake of making this point that this is too binary, divides our understanding of the past within an anthropocene sense of history. Is there a romanticism in this separation of the geological and the historical? That sense that the geological is the pure and the natural is the pure and the historical is the one that contaminates the geological. And that is the main challenge that I have. That is the main question that I have to pose. And you know, one of the, one of the main uh, questions that is driving me here is how do we write a political history of nature? How do we write a political history of the art, which is seemingly, was seemingly without people? And that is the question of the political history of, 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 of the art that is driving me my, my questions. And I'll, this is the, the end of the abstract nature of the lecture. And I'll give you two examples to illustrate the problems that I have highlighted here. And one of the examples is from the history of coal, which is one of the key points about um, the ecological destruction and our current moment of uh, fossil fuel destructions and um, and how I would try like to um, problematize the history of coal in a natural and historical frame that how the history of coal can be written in both natural and historical frame. So I'm suggesting that the coal has two histories and one of them is a familiar one. And what I have here in front of you are the coal fields of Jharia in Eastern India which were um, discovered uh, what, or, or excavated during the colonial period under the geological survey of India and became the Jharia coal fields became the largest and it's probably still one of the largest coal mines in India. And, uh, um, what, what, and this is the dark history of coal and what, what you have is a picture of the fires that are burning. And it's amazing that these fires that are burning deep inside the Jharia coal mine started during the colonial period. And some of these coal fires are actually continuously burning. Now, this is a narrative of coal that you would be familiar with. This is a narrative of, of coal where the historical has disturbed the geological. And the coal mines are burning even today. And, um, uh, and so this is the, uh, the one moment. But what is the other moment of the coal history is that the same Jharia coal mines or other coal mines in India, South Africa, Australia, also discovered this fascinating uh, plant fossils like the Glossopteris. And it is through the finding of the Glossopteris fossils which actually um, became the coal, the Glossopteris plants that, that be decomposed and became coal gave rise to this massively fascinating idea of the geological. So there is this, there is a deep geological history that is excavated from the dark coal mines into this imagination of the coal swamps. So this is the coal swamps of Gondwana land. If, and you know, Gondwana land is the southern landmass that was part of Africa, Southern Africa, uh, Australia, South Asia, and South America. So the vision of this Gondwana land as a geological prehistoric landmass is actually excavated from our historical coal mines. So that is the moment that I am trying to, um, trying to understand that political content of the geological moment that we see in the one. So if I want to put it very blankly, on the left, what you have is a black history of coal. And on the, on the right, what you have is a white history of coal. Or if I, if I may say, it's a whitewashed history of coal. And it is that two histories of coal that I'm presenting in front of you. One is the familiar, the other is an escapist history of coal. The other example is from the big hole uh, of Kimberley in South Africa, which you know the largest, um, one of the largest diamond mines. Um, and and um, it's, 
uh, I've not been there, but I, I believe I've talked to people who have visited. It's one of the most fascinating human created uh, landscape. So this is Anthropocene in a way that we are making, we have made geological changes into the landscape. It's so deep that it almost appears natural as a, as a, as a formation, but it's actually a uh, human creation. And I'm just, I was reminded when I was reading about the Kimberley uh, mines um, about William Gerben uh, Atherston, who the person, he was a surgeon in South Africa, a physician who actually discovered many of the gold and diamond coal mines of Kimberley. And there's a moment that he writes in his, in his notes as he's sitting back and looking at the landscape changing, the historical taking over the geological, if you know what I mean by now, by these mining activities, the whole landscape being dug, dug up, being disturbed by these massive mining activities. And he's, at, he's sitting by that afternoon in that looking forward to this entire landscape and his mind is casting back to a prehistoric time in that same landscape when he writes about the, that, that this nature existed without this, without this, these mining activities. But the same mines had found him the fossils within which he's linking in that how this South African land mines were, were gold mines were linked to the South, South, South Asian gold mines, the same fossils, the same formations, the same landscape. It is the moment sitting in front of that historical moment of the geological of the geology being changed by human activity, that the prehistoric discovery takes place. So it is the, 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 the inescapability of one from the other. That is for me, the biggest problem. That is for me, that impossibility of the escapism that I am trying to capture in my talk here. So, um, to conclude this part, the coal mines of the, the colonial coal mines of a diamond and coal appeared disenchanting to those very people who had found them as they promised to disrupt the pristine prehistoric landscape. Conceived at the time of a growing detachment of, to a degenerative modernity, Anthropocene is a product of deep naturalism, a search for primitive nature and escape into a pristine form of life. It is possible to understand Anthropocene through this twin frame of enchantment with geohistory and disenchantment with its concomitant historical quotient. I can leave you here uh, with these thoughts, but uh, you might wonder that am I leaving um, you with an impossibility of, of a question to answer? And I'm going to share you know, the last few minutes I'm left with of how I am trying to, in my future research, address this question of writing a political history of the Anthropocene or a polit political history of geohistory. And one of the uh, projects that I'm trying to do is, uh, is trying to realign the historical narrative with the natural one, the one that was separated um, in the 19th century the, from the historical and the natural. And I've constantly tried to show how the two cannot be separated, the historical and the natural. So I'm trying to uh, study uh, with colleagues in Australia and South Africa, uh, what I'm calling the reclaiming Gondwana land. And I'm using the term reclaiming in two senses. One, I'm reclaiming Gondwana land from a geological history to write a natural or a historical history of Gondwana land. And uh, as I've talked to you about, Gondwana land is that massive landmass which was connected through uh, land bridges, imagination. Uh, uh, the first imagination was that it was connected through land bridges, which you can see. But then with continental drift theory, it was believed that the continents had actually moved which was Gondwana land and, and Pangea, uh, from broken away from Pangaea, the Gondwana land and Laurasia, and the continental drift had separated the two. So one is reclaiming Gondwana land from a geological narrative to a historical narrative. But the second meaning of reclaiming is that it's the same Gondwana land regions are one of the regions which have uh, had had huge tribal populations displaced, displaced in Australia, India, South America from their land. And it's, it's a way of writing their history or writing that history is almost reclaiming the land in itself, the historical land in itself. So it's a dual historicization of Gondwana land that I'm writing to. And I'm doing this by, uh, with, with colleagues and uh, with, uh, in, in different places by showing 
that how the Gondwana land, which is a geohistorical imagination, constantly features within Gond, who are the Aboriginal tribes. And I've written about this, so I'm not going into great details. The Gond tribes, the Gondwana land name comes from the Gond tribes uh, who are believed to be the Aboriginal tribes of Central India. Um, so the region was originally called Gondwana, which is the forest of the Gonds, and how that became a landmass. So, so how the historical was taken over within a geological narrative, the historical Gondwana within a geological Gondwana land. So, and what we are trying to show that how the prehistoric geological imagination of a landmass is a part of a political history within Gondwana in, in India as a claim back for tribal land by, by return to a tribal culture. And this is a painting by Gond activists in, in India who are using the geological metaphor in a way to claim back their political landscape, their political rights over a land which is increasingly being taken over by mining activities, the same, the my historical mining activities. So what I'm trying to show is that it is impossible to separate the historical from the natural in writing the history of the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Prasik. That was wonderful. Um, uh, and a really sort of um, pungent uh, sort of outline of uh, some of the, the key ideas you've been exploring. It's, it's great to hear about um, the Reclaiming Gondwana Land project as the sort of, as the, as the next um, sort of stage of this work. Um, so what we were going to do now is that um, uh, Anna Echterholter and I were just going to sort of give some very brief um, comments, partly, you know, having uh, looked at the book and partly listening to, um, uh, to Pratik. Um, Anna, do you, want, do you want to go first or should I go first? What, what would you rather do? I could go first if you like. Yeah, sure. So, because I think, as as uh, as a German in in this round, I have to ask about this um, last. I know it's inverted, but if you show these signs, um, you would probably like to to comment on that very briefly. But I, you know, being German, have to ask that. And um, I do have two other questions. One is um, about this. Um, Anthropocene Working Group. So they're a group of geo uh, geochronological experts, they're geologists, and um, in, the, in this time they're looking, in the next two years, they're looking for global boundaries, stratus type, section, and points. So these um, DSSP points, the markers that actually de determine where a new strata of uh, uh, geological time um, begins. And um, they will actually have an opening ceremony where they say this is passed through their um, scientific um, procedure, this is, um, now official um, geology. And I had two reactions to this news. I thought, oh my God, I want to be there when they uh, announce a new epoch of Earth. Um, and the second was a little more petty, I think. It was, oh my God, why do they get to define time? Why do they? Um, with all their data, and this is a global, um, very sophisticated search for three difficult, uh, three different types of markers um, compared over the whole earth. Why do they have this right to uh, begin a new epoch based on data? And this is probably what you're referring to when you say um, this is a naturalization. Maybe they're even overstepping. I mean, maybe even the natural becomes partly more mythological. So I wanted to ask you about this very situation. So what is the, in this very moment, what, what, what is happening um, in this moment? And a second question would be um, from a very different angle because your book is so very rich in um, Indian history in the history of Indology in the history of Indian antiquarianisms. And it is very rich in um, various deep times that develop in various disciplines. So I would ask you as a um, the only, probably only critic of time that I know, and like a literary criticist, but you're really a criticist of, of um, time spans, of deep times. Um, I was wondering whether there's so little chronology, so this um, science of time um, in what we have talked about right now. And what is, for example, an Indian chronology, what would you see 
um, happening there? And is that part and parcel of this politics of deep time that you're talking about? Or would chronology be the wrong way? Would it be more important to sort of indulge more in um, other types of um, information, other formats of information, not chronological ones, but probably more narrated ones? So um, I have more questions, but probably these um, quick ones at first. Great. Um, Pratik, do you want to do you want to deal with those deal with those first, and then I then I can say a little something, and then we and, and you can respond to that, and then we can open out more more broadly to to everyone uh, on the on the uh, in, in the meeting. Sure. Um, th thank you, Anna, um, for uh, two uh, uh, important questions, and um, so about I, I'll. I'll um, Try to answer the first question. Sorry, the second question first. Um, and so, uh, what I was trying to do in the book itself, um, and I'm trying to just be as clear as possible for those who are not familiar with the book, is um, so there are various notions of time. Uh, this is not a ma massive point to make. There are always various notions of time coexisting um, in different regions and different um, contexts. But what I so uh, what I was trying to show is that there is um, so in in the the British Indologist or the Orientalist eighteenth century discovery there is a certain deepening of time of Indian history of Indian time from the textual studies, which uh, then uh, discover which then uh, from from the eighteenth century then moved to the nineteenth century more Vedic history and there's another layer of time being um, being being presented. And on, so on, on, that's a textual reading of time that is taking place from the 18th to the 19th century. Um, and at the same time, there is a study of, um, of, of Aboriginal tribes and communities, which is, which is not so text-based, which is more anthropological, uh, and also this, with the discovery of paleo-historical remains, the archeological remains. So, so there is a, a, a different notion of time that is existing at the same moment. And then there's a study of mythologies, which, uh, which I show that how mythology is allowed to make the jump for Orientalists into deep time from textual to a prehistory. prehistory. So rather than mythologies being a problem of the prehistoric notion of the secular notion of time, mythologies or, or the reading of Indian myths actually allow uh, Indologists, geologists to, to uh, make the connection from within which uh, where there are several missing links within that history of time. So mythologies become an, a very important part of the imagination of the prehistory in India. That's why mythologies always remain part of the prehistoric imagination in India. All of that I am trying to argue that in the 19th century, all these various notions of time that existed from um, before, but also in the British imagination of Indian antiquity from the 17th and 18th century, uh, are gradually linked to the nature, the uh, time of nature. So there is a gradual um, linking of all those various questions of Aboriginality, mythology, Indology, are finding their base within the deep history of nature itself. So that that is the main point. In, in, in the quick nutshell that I can present about the book itself, that it naturalizes. Um, that's the why the, it's called a naturalization of antiquity, that the various notions of antiquity that exist in India, the history of nature becomes the one that decides all those notions of time in itself. And they coexist, but to prove mythologies, you have to go to the nature. To prove aboriginality, you have to go to nature. To prove Indology, you have to go to nature. So nature becomes the fundamental premise on which the idea of time is decided in the 19th century. And that uh, allows me to answer the first question. Uh, I, so I don't, didn't know about this um, Anthropocene uh, announcement about a new epoch of time. I would be interested to know how they do that. But the point is that it is a naturalization of antiquity, that, that nature, it is a study of nature that provides you that clue. Uh, that it is the dominant notion of a time that allows geologists, the, the moment of prehistory is the geologist's finest hour, is because that allows their tools to understand 
the basic notion of time and within which all notions of time have to play. So it is by the naturalization of antiquity that they are able to provide us. And I'm trying to understand that process that how na time became naturalized. So it's the naturalization of antiquity that allows them to understand. And the problem I have is where is politics here? So my co constant question in the book and in this talk is how do you locate the question of politics within that idea of time? Great, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, so, so Simon Turner, who's who's actually involved in coordinate, who's a member of the who's uh, in UCL geography department, um, is involved in coordinating um, uh, all of the different candidate sites that the Anthropocene Working Group is currently working you know, working on, uh, in in order to so, so synthesizing the data and and um, coordinating the research of those those different. Um, those different groups. He, he he was on the call. He was in the meeting earlier, but he has to leave in the middle of it. But he said he would be back uh, later. So it, hopefully, if he um, if he comes back in later, we can um, uh, we can stop him and uh, uh, and talk to him about that. Um, so just just to um, make a few uh, comments uh, on, on Pratik's talk and, and and on the book before uh, before we open out more more broadly. And as I just uh, wrote in the, in the chat a minute ago. Um, do you feel uh, free to, uh, to to gather your thoughts and put put questions in there, um, or equally, we'll we'll be happy to take um, you know uh, verbal questions by you know, raising raising the hand using the the icons. That I'm sure you're all um, uh, more than used to uh, now. I mean, I think it's it's it, we're really pleased that we can launch this sort of seminar series with a with a paper that that enables us to think critically. Um, about this, this what is this concept of the Anthropocene, which has, of course, uh, become enormously uh, influential very, uh, very, very quickly, and and, and Pratik's book seems to me to sort of join uh, in a in a really rich empirical way um, a tradition of kind of critical thinking about the the implications of using the Anthropocene as a as a mobilizing tool as much as, any, as both a mobilizing tool and as a as a heuristic concept. Um, uh, inscriptions of nature seems to me to be a wonderful uh, contribution to you know the the, the various different thinkers um, uh, you know Jason Moore, um, uh, uh, Christophe Bonnet, and uh, uh, and Fressel and uh, Catherine Yusuf amongst others, in in thinking about how what some of the problematic things in the heart of this idea is, um, and it's it's very interesting it seems to me to think about geology itself as a discipline as a as an act uh, of reconstitute of, of the reconstitutive historical imagination think of geology itself as a as a kind of a actively historical imagination in in, in reading these different layers um uh, and, and trying to extrapolate from that what uh, where they've uh, where they've come from and one of the things that the book is is wonderfully rich on is, is stressing the entanglement of Colonial geology and archaeology and ethnology and all of that process. That there's, you know, we're used to thinking about um, uh, the Anthropocene in, in uh, a contemporary uh, context in in this very uh, interdisciplinary way. But what one of the things that Pratik points out in the book is that this is, you know, that that its emergence was in itself a highly interdisciplinary and a characteristically nineteenth century um, uh, mode of interdisciplinarity. Um, you know, in 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 that way, he's very skeptical of the sort of neutral ground geological um, narratives. And and in fact, one of the one of the very interesting things that comes out of it, and it's implicit, I think, in in what you've just been you've just been saying, one of the in, very interesting things for me to fall out of the book is 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 the way that you reveal the Anthropocene itself as this highly nostalgic concept, really. You know, it's uh, it, 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 or at least insofar as the Anthropocene ever posits a pre-Anthropocene, you know, that's what we're nostalgic for. That's the that's the um, uh, the 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 moment um, that we're nostalgic for. That projection of deep nature into this pre uh, this pre-Anthropocenic uh, moment um, uh, is 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 very powerful, and I, I think that's something that it's 
that, that obviously sort of um, raises one's um, critical faculties in terms of thinking about what, what is going on inside this, uh, this concept. I wanted to just, uh, just ask two questions. One is, one is about um, chronology and one is about interdisciplinarity. Um, the question about chronology is, is in relation to religion really, um, insofar as um, you know, many of these um, uh, ethnographers and geologists and um, uh, archeologists would have been carrying religious, you know, colonial religious ideas with them. And to ask you know, whether as it were, I mean, the, the, the characteristically 19th century idea of the Anthropocene, which is how you, you put it at one point in the book, whether in, that indeed is a character, that, that, that mode of, of, in, of interleaving geology and um, uh, archeology span is indeed quintessentially um, a quintessentially 19th century way of articulating it. But my question is really, what well, does that not have its own antecedents? And I mean, particularly in thinking about um, the, 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 the very long established moment in both the Jewish and the Christian tradition, when there is, there is a space for nature without humanity before, before the creation of, of, of Adam and Eve, that, that is, that, you know, that's the sort of moment within a religious um, uh, sensibility where, where one, you know, and it's not, I don't think, an accidental that that is before the fall. Um, you know, that, that, is, that is the moment of nostalgia, that is the moment of loss. Um, so my question is whether there are not both pre-19th century versions of this um, uh, separation, but also whether the, whether the, the scientization of that relationship in, in the way that you, you describe so well in the book also has a sort of hidden, hidden religious shadow behind it that is not scientific, but is, is, is precisely that religious. So, so the question about chronology, about whether there are, whether there are different versions of this um, configuration that one can take back. The question about interdisciplinarity is, is, the, is the question of consilience, which, um, you know, which, which you're, you're questioning, and I think absolutely rightly. So there's a, there's a question about whether what, as you say, whether, whether historians of science should be involved in simulating what science is doing or interrogating um, what science is doing. It's a very powerful picture of the, the, the interdisciplinary collaboration of geologists, archeologists, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in the book. Now, in our presence, in, in the pressing context you, 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 you nice, so, so nicely touched on, historians are faced with the question of how it is they should be contributing, if that's the right word, word or interrogating. Um, uh, the way in which these questions are being articulated. So it seems to me that, that one, one, by challenging the, the risks, by, by showing the costs uh, of adopting an anthropocenic mode that is, that is splitting nature and humans off in, in, in the way you do, it seems to me that there's, the, the, there's a very clear cost in, in, uh, in buying into that, but there's also a cost in not buying into it insofar as that's the sort of framework around which so much is being um, being mobilized and, and therefore a question about how how historians are going to in, engage with that mode of presenting uh, human relations with uh, with non-human spaces species etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and how given that the power relations between the disciplines are as imbalanced as they are how you know how historians can leverage their weight in the most effective in the most effective way, um, if their attitudes to one of the the kind of dominant concepts is going to be a um, at the very the very least a sort of side on one. So that's not to imply that one has to buy into the Anthropocene, but just to sort of try to understand what the what the kind of costs of both buying into it, but uh, and of not not buying into it might be. Um, for, 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 us, uh, for us as sort of practitioners of history. Thank you, John. Um, very, very uh, powerful questions. Uh, thank you so much. Um, 
and I'm not even sure I'm going to be able to answer them in fully. Uh, it's because it's kind kind of an emerging uh, concept in my own mind, and we are all struggling um, with this uh, with this problem or with this theme about how to write about the, about nature and how how nature is a reflection about ourselves. I think the first question um, is a very very uh, critical one, and so you are absolutely right. Uh, that in the in the religious frame there is a nature, and there is a nature that is escapist. So there is a there's an uh, there's an there's a nostalgic nature, and then there is human nature, and that so it's uh, so it's it's a it's a kind of a similar pattern uh, of nature being an escapism and humans being the problem in that in that historical imagination. And I'm and absolutely um, of. Uh, in agreement with you that there is, there there are that 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 moment is not necessarily a 19th century moment that moment pre existed the idea of the nature itself the only point uh, i am making is that 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 idea of nature that existed within religion um, and that's not just in christian I, uh, christianity but it's the same in uh, islamic and, and also hindu um, ideas that that moment that that imagination of nature is in the 19th century deeply influenced by the geological notion of time and and and, and that uh, so and within that frame the religious drops out the nature stays of the the nature of the religion stays not in, in hinduism because hinduism is used as the religion is used to de to develop the vision of nature itself and it always remains an integral part of the, the vision of nature itself. That's why the Hindu imagination goes back constantly. But what you see uh, in the 19th century, which is different, and where I think the consilience question comes in, is that moment of all of these visions coming together and the sifting of the ideas of time takes, taking place, where the geological notion of time is giving a new frame to the religious and, <clears throat> and Aboriginal and alternative on other ideas of time and nature that existed. And that geological notion of time uh, and it allows to reread the mythological texts, which happens in the 19th century. The, the, we, so what I show in the book is that how the, the deluge was searched in the 18th century as a geo, became a very different search in the 19th century, which is became a much more geohistorical search for the deluge itself, within even within in Indian texts. So there's a reframing of nature, of even religious nature. I'm probably talking in a lot of abstract, but hopefully people are following me. But it's a reframing of the nature of religion, of religious idea or theological nature within a geological frame of nature in the 19th century, if that makes sense. I can I can say it again <laughs> if you want, but uh, I think I don't think I can repeat the same sentence. But uh, the sense is that the theological notion of nature as an escapism is reframed to yeah. the geological notion of nature in the 19th century. That is why for me the 19th century moment is so important to understand this anthropocentric idea of nature that exists today. Yeah, um, no, that that's that's completely well taken. I mean, and and actually that that that. A particular conversation will will in due course set us up brilliantly for for the next seminar in the series where we'll where Sylvain Piron will talk about the original sin in the Anthropocene uh, at the start of February. But um, uh, yeah, that's that's super. 